Hello, friends. Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to episode number 20 of our National Park Mystery Series, where we present another 10 strange cases for you to ponder. Join us. Let's walk and see. Number 10, Daniel Gerard Shervinka Jr. 28-year-old Daniel Gerard Cervenka Jr. was an incredibly accomplished young man by the time he had reached 28. At the time of his disappearance in 1999, David was studying astrophysics and philosophy and was also a U.S. Navy veteran. When not pondering the limits of time and space, Daniel enjoyed drawing pencil portraits and, like everything else, Daniel was amazing at it. He also played classical guitar and loved to attend karate classes. So, what happened to this bright and outgoing young man? In 1997, Daniel was officially diagnosed with bipolar disorder, although which of the two types has never been specified. Bipolar disorder is characterized by swings of depression and mania. For some people, these swings of mania can take over and feel never-ending, while others plunge into deep depressions for months, only to fall into a manic episode out of nowhere. Bipolar is a complicated disorder, and those with bipolar are not dangerous or a harm to others, so if you or anyone you know is suffering with mental health, please reach out. There's lots of help out there for you and people who want you to do well. After being diagnosed, Daniel was put on medication to help him curb his moods, and for a while, it seemed that Daniel was doing well. That was until he stopped taking his medication, which only made his condition deteriorate further. In May of 1999, shortly before his disappearance, Daniel had swung into another manic episode, and his family was extremely concerned for him. They attempted to have him hospitalized to receive treatment, but Daniel refused. This would be one of the last times his family ever had contact with him, sadly. On the evening of May 28th, Daniel's sister got a phone call from him, and she could tell he was very unwell. He was rambling and shouting at her and proceeded to threaten other members of the family as they tried to calm him down. The situation only escalated further, and his sister called the police, letting them know that Daniel had threatened them and that he was extremely unwell and a danger to himself. Unfortunately, the Phoenix, Arizona Police Department refused to get involved, and according to the Charlie Project, they said they could not become involved as Daniel had not made a specific threat against anyone. He had just threatened his family in general, apparently. With that, the case was dropped, and this would be the last time that Daniel's family ever heard from him. His family tried to call him multiple times, begging and pleading to the universe to grant their wish of hearing Daniel's voice again, but the phone kept ringing through before clicking to voicemail. With Daniel's condition on their minds, the family continued to attempt contact with him, and it wasn't until 11 days after the disturbing phone call that the Phoenix Police Department became involved. 11 days after he made his final phone call, the police department gained entry to Daniel's apartment and found a few clues. Sitting on the table was an open notebook, a Bible, and a full glass of soda. None of these items led the police to Daniel, but then they saw the light of his answering machine blinking. Curious, they checked his answer phone and found a message from a man who had found Daniel's wallet and was offering to return it. In the call, the man described how he had found Daniel's wallet along a road leading into the Four Peaks Wilderness area in the Tonto National Forest on May 29, 1999. The man left his personal details and asked Daniel to get in touch with him to arrange giving the wallet back, but Daniel never called him. Armed with this new information, the Phoenix Police Department headed to the Four Peaks Wilderness area and found Daniel's car near the Klein Trailhead. The car had been abandoned with the key still inside, but there was no sign of Daniel. It was as if he had vanished into thin air, as we often see, leaving no trace behind. Daniel's family would later confirm with officers that he enjoyed day hiking, but had not hiked in the Four Peaks Wilderness area since he was a small child. He was familiar with the Camelback Mountain and Squaw Peak areas, but there was no indication that he had gone to either of those places. The Maricopa County Sheriff's Office also joined in the search for Daniel, but they were unable to uncover any evidence and the search was eventually called off. Since then, Daniel's case has gone cold and the police have received very few tips and leads. According to trackmissing.org, Daniel did not take his camping or hiking equipment with him when he left and only took a sleeping bag. Daniel's family and the U.S. Navy veteran community are continuing their search for him and are asking anyone with any information to come forward. Daniel Danny Gerard Shervinka Jr. is described as a white male with brown hair, blue eyes. He stands 6 foot 1 inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. He has scars on both knees and requires medication to treat his bipolar disorder. 
He was last seen wearing a horizontally striped navy blue and medium gray shirt, light blue denim shorts, and Nike running shoes. Anyone with any information is urged to please contact the Phoenix Police Department at 602-262-6151 and reference case number 908-84103. Number 9. Charles Duane Gustafson 72-year-old Charles Duane Gustafson was an upstanding member of his community in Minnesota and was a devoted father to his four daughters. Charles had studied at an agricultural school in his youth, helping out on the family farmstead where he would later retire. Charles traveled around the country for different jobs and even enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1955. An article written by the Grand Forks Herald detailed Charles' life and achievements, noting that during his time in the Air Force, he taught techniques of survival for global conditions to Air Force personnel. Charles was incredibly adept in survivalism and the outdoors, and his time on the farm, stripping logs and in the Air Force, suited his outgoing, adrenaline junkie nature. In 1969, Charles settled down and married the love of his life, Patricia Rasmussen. Together, the couple had four daughters and were said to be the picture-perfect family. Charles and Patricia were devoted to their children, and when it was time to retire, their children couldn't be happier that their parents were finally getting the break they deserved. During his short time of retirement, Charles would often wander the farm and did his bit for the local community. Charles also loved to hunt, and one hunting expedition would change the course of the Gustafsons' life forever. On October 11, 2006, Charles and a group of his family members headed out into the Medicine Bow National Forest near Arlington, Wyoming. The group hoped to hunt some prize elk and bring them home. At around 6.55 a.m., Charles was seen at the road junction of Highway 111 and 129 in Carbon County. This would be the last time anyone would ever see him. Charles had split off from the group with the agreement being that he would arrive at camp some hours later. But Charles never arrived. Time ticked away and his family members started to become incredibly concerned. Using the skills that he had taught them, they fired three shots in the air to give away their location. Three shots were fired back, but Charles was never found. His family found it incredibly strange that he would fire three shots back, if indeed it was him, but not make his way back to the camp. Perhaps he was injured and in need of help, they thought. His family traversed through the Medicine Bow National Forest, following the sounds of his shots, but they found no sign of him. It was at this point that the Gustafsons knew that this was serious, and the Carbon County Sheriff's Office was called to the scene. The Sheriff's Office, along with search and rescue teams, searched for him for days, but ultimately found nothing. With it being October in Wyoming, the temperatures had plummeted, and a thin blanket of snow had settled on the ground. Concerns for his welfare were growing with every minute that passed, but there were simply no clues to follow. Charles' family revealed to investigators that on October 10, 2006, Charles had gotten lost after separating from the group, but was thankfully found on that occasion. They also added that Charles was incredibly familiar with the Medicine Bow National Forest and had been hunting and hiking there for over a decade. Nothing in Charles' case made sense to investigators or his family. He was a former U.S. Air Force officer and was incredibly skilled under dire conditions. So what had happened to him? As the days wore on and there was no sign of him, the search was eventually called off. A year later, in 2007, Charles was officially declared deceased by the state of Minnesota, and his family held a memorial service for him. Charles Dwayne Gustafson is described as a white male with graying blonde hair, blue eyes, standing 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighing 160 pounds. He wears wireframe glasses, has a small surgical scar on his face, an overbite and several fillings in his teeth. He was last seen wearing a brown hooded sweatshirt, a blaze orange vest, charcoal gray pants, a camouflaged print fanny pack, a blaze orange hat, his wedding ring, and a black Casio watch. The Charlie Project also notes that Charles was carrying the following items, a Winchester 30 6 rifle with green camouflage print stock and a blue metal barrel with a 3x9 scope, a map, a GPS device, a compass, ammo for the rifle, lunch, water, and a hunting knife. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Carbon County Sheriff's Office at 307-324-2776 and reference case number 06-002613. Number 8. 
Robert Larson Hughes. On August 17, 2008, 59-year-old Robert Larson Hughes left his home in Williamsville, Vermont for what would be the last time. He told his family that he was traveling to Provincetown, Massachusetts, for a business meeting, a meeting that he had no intentions of returning from. According to witnesses, the Appalachian Mountain Club shuttle, which takes guests from the nearby lodge and hotels to tourist spots and hiking areas, dropped him off at around 12.30 p.m. The shuttle driver that day recalled that they dropped Robert off at the head of Zeeland Falls Trail in the Pemigewasset Wilderness Area of the White Mountain National Forest that's located in New Hampshire. To those around him, it appeared as though Robert was making the most of his business trip. But inside his mind, there was something much darker going on. After departing the shuttle, Robert Hughes has never been seen or heard from, and three days later, his wife would receive a devastating letter. On August 20th, 2008, Robert's wife collected the mail and found a handwritten envelope from her husband. Inside were letters to his family members. These letters detailed how he had planned to take his own life in the White Mountains. His family were distraught and immediately contacted the authorities who started the search for him. Unfortunately, despite the combined efforts of the Vermont State Police, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department, and search and rescue crews, no sign of Robert has ever been found. Investigators did find that shortly before his disappearance, Robert had tried to make a booking for the Appalachian Mountain Club's Zeeland Falls Hunt Hotel, but the request never went through. His car was later found at the Appalachian Mountain Club's Highland House in Crawford Notch, but it appears no evidence was retrieved. There's been no movement on his phone or bank accounts, and now his family are still desperate for answers. Robert Larson Hughes is described as a white male with gray hair, blue eyes, stands six foot tall, and weighs 190 pounds. Robert had shown intentions of self-harm, and authorities are incredibly concerned for his welfare. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Vermont State Police at 802-254-2382 and reference case number 08-D-202534. Number 7. Daniel Joseph Marks Daniel Joseph Marks was described by his family as a quiet and reserved person who loved to spend time writing music and focusing on his studies. By 2005, Daniel had obtained his bachelor's degree in music from Antioch College and was due to start at Portland State University the next year, focusing on environmental studies. Daniel was kind and passionate and well-connected with his family, so when he failed to make it home for Thanksgiving, they immediately knew something was very wrong. November 19, 2005 was supposed to be a day of joy and reunification. Daniel had moved to Portland, Oregon to pursue his education, leaving his family behind in Minnesota, but he was never one to miss the holidays. As planes came and went from the Twin Cities Airport in Minnesota, Pat and her sister, Mary Falk, excitedly waited for Daniel to walk through the gate. Time passed, and there was still no sign of Daniel, and that is when the excitement turned to worry. Pat later recalled in an interview, Daniel was a no-show. I knew there was something wrong. Pat's mother's intuition kicked in, and she spoke to the airline and discovered something shocking. She found that Daniel had never even boarded the plane from Portland, Oregon to Minnesota. By this point, Pat knew in her gut that Daniel was in danger and contacted the local authorities. Pat's family rallied around her and helped her out in whatever way they could. Luckily, one of the Marks family was computer savvy, and managed to access Daniel's emails, which gave them more clues. In Daniel's inbox sat an email from Miko from Maui. The mysterious Miko had invited Daniel to Maui for a week-long trip of hiking and sightseeing. Pat passed all this information over to the Portland police, who entered Daniel's apartment and found nothing out of the ordinary. The police, both in Minnesota and in Oregon, agreed that it was time to reach out to the Kauai Police Department and a full U.S.-wide investigation was officially opened. Police in the islands took the report seriously and they began retracing Daniel's steps and interviewing any potential witnesses. Through their diligence, they were able to establish that Daniel had arrived in the islands on November 9, 2005 and had stayed in a hostel. A witness remembered talking to Daniel on November 10, 2005 with Daniel telling him that he was heading to Kalalau Valley and was meeting someone there. The last confirmed sighting of Daniel Marks was on November 10, 2005, at around 4 p.m., when he was seen overlooking Waimea Canyon along the Pahia Trail in the Koke State Park. 
After this, Daniel seemed to simply drop off the map and has never been seen or heard from again. Some people reported seeing Daniel carrying tent poles in a small backpack, although there have been varying statements given to investigators. A large-scale search of the area and the state park was conducted, but no sign of Daniel was ever found. Investigators also tried to email back the mysterious Miko, but it appears there was no reply. Investigators in Hawaii believe that Daniel became lost or injured while hiking and had no way of calling for help. There have been multiple sightings of Daniel in the islands, leading many to believe that he may still be there with no recollection of who he is. Some people give credence to this theory following an article published by Vindy.com where Pat goes into detail about Daniel's teenage years. According to the article, while in high school in Ohio, another teen assaulted Daniel, giving him a concussion. He lost his memory for a week. Then, while in Oregon for a college semester, Daniel fell and struck his head on concrete. It resulted in a year of memory loss. Daniel was taken to see neurologists, and it was believed at that time that he might have to abandon his degree pursuits due to his condition. His family now wonders whether Daniel had another lapse and is now living homeless in the island somewhere, not knowing who he is or how he got there. Another theory is that Daniel met with foul play, possibly at the hands of Miko, or possibly someone else. Pat, Daniel's mother, began noticing that men who resembled her son were being reported missing at an alarming rate in Hawaii and couldn't help but wonder whether something dark was going on. She told Vindy.com, I don't like the way Daniel received the information about coming to this island. I don't like the fact that there are a number of young men missing who have extremely similar profiles. Daniel did not inform his family of his impromptu trip to Hawaii, which also stuck out to them as odd. He kept in frequent contact with his family, and a holiday to Hawaii seems like something he would have mentioned in conversation. Daniel Marks remains missing, and despite numerous false sightings, no real evidence has ever been found to suggest where he went. Daniel is described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, standing 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighing 130 to 140 pounds. Both ears and his tongue were once pierced, and he also has the following tattoos. Small black Asian symbols on each temple that are often covered by his hair, and a tattoo of a maple leaf on each upper arm. Daniel also has birthmarks that are pale brown and located on his abdomen. He was possibly last seen wearing a gray t-shirt, khaki cargo pants or shorts, a wrap sarong, sandals, and a watch. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Kauai Police Department at 808 808- 241-1711 and reference case number 2005-30634. Number 6. Jacob Wing 45-year-old Jacob Wing was last seen on Friday, July 10, 2020 on the Old Baldy Trail in the Madeira Canyon in the Coronado National Forest in Tucson, Arizona. According to the few media reports that have been made about Jacob's disappearance, he and a friend entered the canyon on July 11, 2020 and shortly after became separated. The friend tried to look for Jacob, but the mass expanse of the forest made it difficult, so instead he contacted the Pima County Sheriff's Office to officially report his friend missing. Jacob was believed to be carrying a phone at the time, but it is likely that he did not have a signal in the forest. The Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office also joined in on the investigation, and together the two forces headed out into the forest to try and find Jacob. They were later accompanied by the Department of Public Safety Rangers and Border Patrol in an attempt to locate him quickly. A search and rescue helicopter took to the skies for several days during the searches, but ultimately nothing was ever found. Multiple trails and mountains were searched, looking for any sign of Jacob, and his friend told investigators he had no idea which trail Jacob had headed down when they got separated. Investigators and search and rescue crews continued to search for Jacob until July 13th when the search was officially called off. All the information available about Jacob's disappearance is brief, and in a statement to the media, Sheriff Tony Estrada of the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office said, We really don't know what we have right now, and we don't want to speculate on any one thing. Jacob's girlfriend, friend, and family members were all interviewed, but so far no evidence has come to light. There was a bizarre twist added to Jacob's case on July 17, 2020, when the Green Valley News reported that there was a possible witness. According to this article, a hunter ventured down the canyon on July 15, 2020 and saw a man who he is 100% sure was Jacob Wing. The hunter had a brief interaction with the man at around 9.15 a.m. that morning and said the man did not appear to be in distress and did not ask for assistance. 
Investigators have never confirmed this sighting, and it brings about a whole new set of theories. Unfortunately, Jacob's case has not been entered into NamUs, but it appears that the Santa Cruz and Pima County Sheriff's offices are continuing to work on his case. Currently, there are no further plans to search the Madeira Canyon, and Jacob's family and friends are hopeful that one day they will have answers. Anyone with any information about Jacob is asked to please contact the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office at 520-761-7869 or the Pima County Sheriff's Office at 520-351-4650. Number 5. Robert Perry Bissell 57-year-old Robert Perry Bissell was a keen outdoorsman and experienced hiker and hunter. When not working, Robert could be found spending time in the great outdoors, and over his lifetime he had been on hundreds of hunting and hiking expeditions in the United States. Living in Portland, Oregon gave Robert access to plenty of wilderness spaces, and on July 12, 2010, Robert packed his gear and headed for the Roaring River Wilderness Area in the Mount Hood National Forest. On the morning of July 12, 2010, Robert pulled up to the Trailhead 700 in his white 1989 Nissan Sentra and found a place to park. He then hiked around five miles to reach his final destination, Middle Rock Lake. Robert set up camp just off trail number 512 and should have settled in for the night, but it was then that something strange happened. Robert had been gone for a few days and his brother was starting to worry. Robert usually ventured into the woods for a few days at a time, but he always made sure to keep in touch with his family. On July 19, 2010, Robert's brother went into Mount Hood National Forest in search of his brother. He came across the camp that Robert had made, along with a note that made it appear though Robert was gone for a night or two and would be back soon. Robert had left behind his sleeping bag and hiking gear, and the only thing that was missing was his fishing rod and tackle. Five days later, on July 24, 2010, Robert's brother officially reported him missing when he failed to make contact. It was now clear that Robert had not gone on a quick overnight hike and that he was possibly in danger. The Clackamas County Sheriff's Office responded to the incident, sending officers and putting the call out for search and rescue teams. In the coming hours, dozens of volunteers and the Clackamas County Search and Rescue Unit had arrived to help look for Robert. As word spread of his disappearance, more resources poured in, with help coming from helicopters, search dogs, 4x4 vehicles, the Air Force Reserve 304th Rescue Squadron, and the Pacific Northwest Search and Rescue Unit. According to reports, the efforts were heavily focused on the Rock Lakes Basin and the trails that lead to it. With Robert carrying his fishing gear, it's likely he may have headed down that way before disappearing. Unfortunately, no sign of Robert has ever been found, despite an extensive search of Mount Hood National Forest. Investigators and others working on Robert's case made sure to check every single area and possible trail, but nothing was ever found. The search was eventually called off and his family were left in limbo. To this day, what happened to Robert is still unknown, and while there are not any active searches, investigators are still looking into his case. It's believed that Robert left his base camp multiple times to go fishing and hunting, and witnesses recall speaking to him as he was setting up his camp on July 12th of 2010. As of this date, Robert's body, clothes, and fishing gear remain missing, and investigators believe that he became injured during his hike. The terrain in Mount Hood National Forest is very rough, and the Charlie Project even reported that horses who helped in the search had to have their shoes replaced as a result. Robert Perry Bissell was last seen near Trail 512 at Middle Rock Lake on July 12, 2010. He is described as a white male with gray hair, green eyes, standing 5 foot 5 inches tall, and weighing somewhere between 135 to 150 pounds. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office at 503-785-5140 and reference case number 2010-22782. Number 4. John Stewart Campbell 18-year-old John Stewart Campbell of Arcata, California, was a bright and promising student at Humboldt State University. John had his whole life ahead of him, and he was eager to complete his college degree and find his place in the world. Unfortunately, John was robbed of that chance, and now his family are seeking answers and justice. John was last seen, last time, on February 16, 1985, on the campus of Humboldt State University. There are very few details available in John's case, and all we know is that a residence hall advisor, or an RA, 
reported him missing after he had not been seen or heard from for a few days. The school informed John's parents, who immediately launched their own search for their son. The Humboldt State University Police Department took on the case, and within a few days, the first clue had emerged. In the days after his disappearance, John's car was found abandoned in a wilderness area. Reports do not state when his car was found or even in which wilderness area it was found. According to University Police Chief Don Peterson, there were no signs of a robbery at the scene, and since then, the case has remained a complete mystery. The prevailing theory is that John was taken against his will in his car, but aside from that, no plausible leads have ever been found. The reports available to us do not indicate whether the car was processed for forensic evidence, and there's little follow-up in John's case, period. The search for John slowly wound down, but that doesn't mean the authorities have given up on his case. John Stewart Campbell was last seen on the campus of Humboldt State University on February 16, 1985. He's described as a white male with blonde hair, blue eyes, standing 5 feet 11 and weighing 160 pounds. The Charlie Project does note that at the time of his disappearance, John was suffering from depression and had some discoloration and freckles on his skin. He was last seen wearing a knee-length gray or green trench coat and was carrying his wallet. Anyone with any information, please contact the Humboldt State University Police at 707-826-5555 and reference case number 09 08 Number 3. Thomas James Crump on October 9, 1993, 44-year-old Thomas James Carlton left his home in Newcomb, New York at around 6 a.m. The morning was bright, the air was crisp, and Thomas knew that his upcoming three-day hike in the high peaks of the Adirondacks was going to be a good one. Not much is known about Thomas' hike or his disappearance, and investigators later found out that he did not take a tent or a stove with him. Thomas had planned on staying in lean-tos along his way, Lean-tos are often featured in national parks and forests and provide hikers and campers with a safe place to cook or hang out. Often, multiple people will sleep and use the lean-to, and it's a great place for hikers to meet and share their stories and have some good company. Adirondack.net advises those wishing to stay in these lean-tos that they should bring a tent just in case the lean-tos are full. Thomas' wife knew of his plans for a solo hike, and when his due date arrived and there was no sign of him, she reported him missing. Thomas had also failed to report to work at the state prison in New York, where he was a psychologist. This sent alarm bells ringing in his wife's head, as she knew that Thomas was devoted to his work and would not miss a single day without letting anyone know. The New York State Police quickly became involved in Thomas' case, and they set about interviewing those on the trail that day. Two hikers came forward, claiming that they had shared a lean-to with Thomas on Indian Pass Trail, four miles southwest of where he had parked his car. Reports do not state on which date they shared the lean-to, though. According to these hikers, Thomas was planning on heading up Indian Pass. As morning came, Thomas bid his farewells and began his hike toward that area. This alleged sighting was likely the last time Thomas was ever seen alive. Police and search and rescue crews scoured the area, but their attempts were hampered by adverse weather. Still, they battled through the rain and snow, but ultimately found nothing. Thomas James Carlton is described as a white male with brown hair, blue eyes, stands 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighs 170 pounds. Thomas sometimes goes by the nickname Tom and wears prescription glasses. He was last seen wearing a beige wool sweater, a maroon Gore-Tex coat, navy Gore-Tex pants over olive green military pants, a red wool cap, hiking boots, and a teal backpack. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the New York State Police at 518 518- 897-2000 and reference case 93-612. Number 2. Jeremy Ivan Childress 31-year-old Jeremy Ivan Childress was described as a kind and caring person who was close to his family and loved to spend time outdoors. Jeremy was an expert hunter and often participated in the annual hunting season with his friends and family. Back at home, Jeremy was married and the couple had two children, and Jeremy is said to have been attentive and loving father and husband. On October 17, 2004, Jeremy, his friend Shane Louie, and Shane's son, Shane Jr., hopped into their truck and headed into the Tillamook National Forest. 
The three agreed to head out into Tillamook County, Oregon, and they were excited about their upcoming hunt. The three set up a base camp, equipped with everything they would need. Later on in the day, the three were heading back to their camp when they became lost. Jeremy soon separated away from the group, and he was now lost too. Shane and Shane Jr. tried shouting for Jeremy and looking for him, but it was as if he disappeared into thin air. The father and son duo finally made it back to camp and noticed that there was still no sign of Jeremy. He had left all of his overnight equipment behind and everything else was untouched. Shane Louie knew that something was very wrong right away, and Jeremy, an experienced hunter and outdoorsman, would never have left his things behind. Shane contacted the Tillamook County Sheriff's Office, and within the hour, investigators were on the scene. According to Shane, he last saw Jeremy at Tucker Creek Road and Boundary Road at around 4.30 p.m. before he mysteriously vanished. A wide-scale search for Jeremy was organized, with investigators and search and rescue teams painstakingly combing over the forest. Tillamook National Forest is filled with rocky and difficult terrain, and it is plausible that Jeremy became injured while trying to find his way back to camp. His mother, Becky Grimes, told the Statesman Journal, I still have hope that one day he'll be found. I'd much rather have him here with us than up there on that mountain. I still can't go up there. This is not about me. I want this to focus on my son and that he's still missing. This needs to be kept out there. It's not the not knowing, but I do have hope. In 2006, Jeremy's wife had him declared deceased in absentia. Jeremy Childress was last seen on October 17, 2004, as described as a white male with brown hair, brown eyes, standing 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighing 170 pounds. At the time of his disappearance, Jeremy was carrying a rifle, a wallet, his car keys, half a pack of Marlboro Red cigarettes, and possibly a pocket knife. Jeremy has previous fractures to the fingers on his right hand, two crooked upper front teeth with the left one being chipped. He also has the following tattoos, a dolphin and the number 14376 on his right shoulder and a rising phoenix on his left shoulder. At the time of his disappearance, he was also sporting a mustache. He was last seen wearing a dark brown Carhartt jacket, blue Levi jeans, a blue Nike cap, brown Copeland hiking boots, a silver citizen watch, and a gold wedding band with five diamonds set diagonally. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact the Tillamook County Sheriff's Office at 503-842-2561 and reference case 2004-14591. And number one, David Milton Crouch. 27-year-old David Milton Crouch of Stevensville, Maryland, was an avid cyclist and enjoyed everything bike-related. He even owned a bike shop with his wife, and the two were living their dreams and pursuing their passion while also making money. Unfortunately, the bubble of freedom and bliss was broken on a breezy autumn day. August 31, 1997, David left his home for what would be the last time. David, along with three friends, were hiking through the Bridger Teton National Forest thanks to the help of a guide. The Bridger Teton National Forest is located in western Wyoming, over 2,000 miles away from his home in Maryland, and it's unlikely that any of the group would have been familiar with the forest. During the hike on August 31st of 97, David became separated from the group, and according to reports, it appears as though he headed off on a solo hike to Island Lake. The Doe Network states that David was last seen at the lake, although this has not been confirmed by law enforcement. David intended to fish at Island Lake before returning to the group, but that unfortunately never happened. When the group realized he was missing, they retraced their steps and began looking for him everywhere. As night fell, the group were forced to retreat to their base camp at Lost Lake and wait out the night. The next morning, the four appeared out of their tent to find that David was still missing, and that's when they contacted the Sublet County Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office, along with search and rescue teams, flooded into the Bridger Teton National Forest looking for any sign of the man. Over the evening of August 31st into September 1st, the temperatures had plummeted, and now there were great concern for David's well-being. As the solo fishing trip had been impromptu, he had not taken any of his supplies with him, including a sleeping bag or warm clothing. Eventually, the search was called off, and despite combing the forest, the Sublette County Sheriff's Office was unable to find any sign of David. 
Investigators believe that he perished due to the elements and low temperatures that night, and it's possible that he may have been injured along the way and was unable to call for help. David Milton Crouch was last seen on August 31, 1997, in the Bridger Teton National Forest. He is described as a white male with brown hair, standing 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighing 175 pounds. He was last seen wearing jeans and a flannel shirt, and anyone with any information is asked to contact the Sublette County Sheriff's Office at 307-367-4378 and reference case number 97-2891. Well, folks, there you have it. What do you think of these strange disappearances? How can a person just simply vanish and leave no trace? I look forward to your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. As for me, I'll see you a little further on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.